Welcome to another episode of Sideline Sanity with me, Michelle Tafoya. We'd love it if you would subscribe. You would love it if you subscribe because you're going to get more and more interviews like the one we have coming up, the great David Horowitz. Maybe you've read him in the New York Times. Maybe you've read him in Vanity Fair. Goodness knows if you're alive, chances are you've read David Horowitz. And if you haven't, you're going to want to listen to this. This is a man who grew up the son of two communists here in America. He was part of the radical left, radical left, until some pivotal things happened in his life, and he took stock of where he was and what he was seeing, and whoa, did he make a change. And now he's got another book out called The Next Election Could Be the Last. The title is Final Battle. The Next Election Could Be the Last, David Horowitz. He is a remarkable person to listen to. Again, raised by communists radical leftist, and now he's a conservative. You'll want to listen to this. David has done so much, so much experience, so much, so much. I, it's hard to know how to describe David Horowitz without saying, it's, trust me and just listen. For nearly three decades, she's reported the action from the sidelines. She started very young. She's covered the NBA, NFL, Olympics, and the college football and basketball national championships. And now, during these insane times in our world, Michelle Tafoya thinks we need a serious dose of sanity. This is Sideline Sanity with your host, one of the sanest people on planet Earth, Michelle Tafoya. David Horowitz, it's an honor to welcome you to this podcast. Uh, you've written so much, and I'm an admirer of your work. I don't know quite where to start because you're able to talk about such a breadth of things. But I, I want to, if, if for anyone in my audience who doesn't know exactly where you come from, I think it's really important that they learn that, that they understand your background. So how would you describe your childhood and your you know, your upbringing via vis-a-vis -vis your parents? My parents were um, high school teachers and totally law-abiding, except they were part of, uh, they were members of the Communist Party and, and therefore they were thought of themselves as revolutionaries who didn't believe in American law. And uh, for example, they hid an East German communist that the government wanted to deport in our basement. And we had the FBI outside all the time. As a result, I was one of the founders of the new left in the 60s. I was at Berkeley in 1960. And I edited um, the largest magazine of the left. And I got off the boat when uh, the Black Panther Party murdered um, my bookkeeper, who I had recruited to keep the books of the Black Panther Party. I believed our own propaganda. Um, and that derailed me for a good decade. Um, I, I just was crushed, not only because this was a decent woman who had three children, um, but because everything I had believed led me to this point, and I had to figure out what to do with my life and uh, how to re reconfigure my brain, as it were. So I have um, I an intense familiarity with the political left, well, and I know how dangerous they are. That, that's um, that's a horrifying story. If I can, and, and tell me if I'm getting too personal here, but how, right. how was this bookkeeper murdered? How did the Black Panthers, and why did they murder her? They held her. I learned a lot about murder when the, the police interviewed me. And disposing of bodies is a big problem and hiding them. Um, they kept her for six weeks. She went. She was in a bar um, and walked out with a, somebody, obviously, from the Black Panther Party, whom she knew, um, and never returned. And by the time the police fished her body out of San Francisco Bay, I knew the Panthers had killed her. And all my friends 
were accusing the white power structure, even after I told them that I, I, knew, I believed that the Panthers had murdered her. Um, what, what made you believe that, that your friends didn't? People in the, on the left are in a bubble. They think they're saving the world, and therefore they explain away any crime their friends have committed, uh, and they never look back. Um, that's one of the things I learned when I came out of the left. I, I saw that the right, I, for example, J. Edgar Hoover was once an American hero. You, everybody worshipped him. And then there were revelations about what he actually did as the head of the FBI. And now nobody ever talks really about J. Edgar Hoover, except there's a building named in his honor. And I realized that the right, you know, like the left, it's composed of human beings. So there's going to be awful things associated with it. But at least um, people on the right, um, the, the people that we hated because they were anti-communists have a way of correcting or attempting to correct for the past. And uh, when the Vietnam War ended, for example, the left that I was part of claimed to be anti-war um, and for the self-determination of the Vietnamese. So when, when the left forced the United States to withdraw because there was no political support for the war uh, and proceeded to slaughter two and a half million Indo-Chinese peasants, uh, there were no demonstrations. And I saw the left was lived a lie. Uh, there never was an anti-war movement. There was only an anti-American movement. And conservatives are raised sort of properly, so they give people the benefit of the doubt, but way too much. So I made it my mission to open patriots' eyes to the menace from the left. And unfortunately, I didn't have a loud enough voice uh, to warn them sufficiently. I wrote five books about the left's takeover of the universities, and that, that's the source of most of our problems. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I attended Berkeley, so I am I'm well versed in in how that <laughs> that leftist ideology permeates universities. At least it did. Oh, it did terrible. mine. I have a campaign to defund the universities until they behave like universities. Well, and you saw what I... happened at Stanford last week with Stanford oh, Law. Well, that woman should be fired. Yes, she should, but she won't be. And that's that's um, I think that's something that people really have a problem with is this lack of accountability when it's right there on all of our problems can be traced to the lawlessness that's overtaken our society because of the Democrats. That's why we have a, a crime epidemic in our cities. That's yeah. why we have no borders. And we're going to pay for that for generations. Um, wherever you look. There's nobody to enforce the law. It, you and you the mentioned Democrats are 100 percent responsible for that. Yeah, I, I would I would agree. And it's uh, I used to be a Democrat when I was young, but uh, I, I see the folly in it as well. One of the things I, we're seeing, I voted for Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> if we you mentioned the borders, and in the last 24 hours, a, a videotape has surfaced of. A, a number of about a thousand Americans trying to. Ninety percent of Americans won't see those, those videotapes. Right, right. Uh, you know that that's so troubling. How do we fix well, that? that? How do we I fix can, just that? Just the book I've just written called "Final Battle: The Next Election Could Be the Last." Uh, documents how the Democrat Party is a totalitarian party. How it, its main goal is a one-party state. And that, you can see that from the way they treated Trump at the outset. Uh, here's a guy who was a lifetime liberal guest at the Kennedy, at the uh, Clinton's, uh, Chelsea's wedding, I guess, uh, received NAACP awards. All of a sudden he becomes a white nationalist and, and white supremacist, which is laughable. Um, but 
half the country believes that, uh, thanks to the Democratic Party. They lie. You know, it's almost a miracle when a, a truth comes out of their lips. And that's all of them. They're, we're... The the destruction of our borders was illegal and unconstitutional mm -hmm. uh, because the president doesn't have the authority to make immigration law only to enforce it, which he won't do. And that, right. in effect, changes the law. Now we have open borders. It, uh, it, yeah. it used to, it, let me let me just get to that a little bit more, because you talk about the fact that the borders are so porous. Yeah, they're, they're, they're like Swiss cheese. Let's be honest. It's ridiculous what's going on there. And we and you said we'll pay for it for generations. I think we already have been paying for it with the... Oh, yeah. People are being murdered. No yeah, question. Right. And, and the and fentanyl right? that's coming across has killed All you know 100,000 Americans a year. What but is... so? Stop with the fentanyl. The fe More people are dying every year from fentanyl than died on our side, our, our, our army died in our army during World War II. Yeah, yeah. I, jo Joseph Biden is a traitor to this country. His family has become rich by taking bribes from foreign uh, countries, chief among them our chief adversary, which is communist China. He's opened the doors of our country to infiltration by the China, and particularly our universities. We even have Chinese communist police stations in America to keep tabs on the, the Chinese who escaped China to live in America. It's just, it's horrifying what's happened. I, I agree. And so when we look at the border and you assert in your book that really this, this acceptance of all of these newcomers to come in without any kind of due process, without just coming across, it will help aid in this move toward a one party state. What what like to me it seems pretty obvious, but someone's going well, to, to, to someone's going to push back to you and say what proof do you have? Why how why do you think Joe Biden and his administration really wants that? You really think that that's what they're trying to do and Joe you say Biden well, is a scumbag. <laughs> I mean this is a, one of the worst politicians we've ever had. Mm. And he's been it all his life, a shameless liar. Uh, I mean, the, the scope of the lies he told when he was younger and not brain damaged was breathtaking. Uh, you know, and he had to drop out of a presidential race for total lies about his educational career. Um, they're just bad people. He's a pedophile. I mean, look what he did to his daughter. Uh, and he's a thief. What did he do to his daughter that you're sure of? Well, he took showers with her when she was a teenager. And she she has written a book um, blaming her, her own uh, sexual promiscuity on him and and the problems that uh, she would became. A, well, he got two children who were drug addicts. I mean, come on. This guy is the worst news imaginable. And people talk, we sanitize our language. You don't find people saying, they say Biden is compromised by his, what he took from the Chinese and the Ukrainians and the um, uh, whatever else. Uh, uh, but you don't find people saying he's a traitor, which he is. This is treason. This is, I, there's no other way to explain it. You how, don't get, how much faith do you have that the current, you know, since the Republicans have taken back the House and they are having these hearings now, how much confidence do you have that they can actually prove any of this or are willing to try to I, prove any I, of this? I think the tide is turning. And, uh, you know, one of the really probably the most important thing that Trump has done is he's created the first conservative, patriotic mass movement in the history of the country. Millions of people go to his rallies. Um, a lot of this happened because Republicans did nothing. Uh, you know, they were trustees of universities and allowed them to be taken over by these basically communists who hired people for their politics and uh, changed the curriculum into an indoctrination program and 
cultural Marxism. Um, Republicans did nothing. Uh, you know, people like Bill Kristol were sitting on the boards of George Mason University and did nothing. And it's not for one of, I, as I, I wrote four or five books about this and I, you know, knew Crystal. I mean, he's shown his true colors since then. But. What changed about him? Why would he do that? You know, I understand the left. I do not understand conservatives. <laughs> I've never been able to figure them out. Um, you know, the left calls conservatives and patriots racists, white supremacists, insurrectionists, and conservatives call them liberals. <laughs> what the heck are they liberal about? They're vindictive bigots is what they are. So, you know, we're fighting this war with one hand tied behind our backs, but I think that, and, and that's why Trump is such a problem for them, because he, he's a take no prisoners kind of guy. And that's what they need. Somebody needs to stand up and call them out for what they're doing and what they are. I mean, the lies are just un, unreal. So do you believe that that Trump sh should be the president again? Or do, yeah, do you I think he, he's, he's what's needed. I mean, I, I like Ron DeSantis, and I, I don't have anything really critical to say about him. But Trump is so is tested. Nobody in human history has been attacked as much as Trump, and unfairly. Um, so I I think that he's going to be the standard bearer. I just think that people people won't say. You know, people are cautious about what they say. It's, it's tragic. Our country, you know, has come to that. I remember being a kid and saying, you know, America's a free country. I can say whatever I want. Yeah. No more. Th that's, you can say it, but you get punished. Yeah, well, that, that's precisely, I don't know how much you know about me, Mr. Horowitz, but I quit my job covering the NFL because yeah, I, I saw this. I saw the writing. I mean, I saw this happening to really good people, like that had no malintent, who maybe questioned uh, covid you know, its origins or its treatment, or do we really need to keep kids out of school? And and they were silenced. They were punished. Some lost their jobs, you know, canceled, you, you name it. Now it's, terrible. It's, it's been, it's been awful. How much of a, of a snapback do you see coming? I mean, you said you think, think the tide is in turning. A, in the early stages of a fascist state. Yeah. yeah. I think the treatment, you know, putting Peter Navarro, a, uh, presidential advisor in leg irons because he had a constitutional issue uh, with the Jan January 6th committee or the way they concocted the, I mean, Biden and uh, Hakeem Jeffries, and uh, they all have the same line. And within the last few weeks, it said that five Capitol Police officers were killed by the protesters. Yeah, that's, that's a, a total that's, lie. That's a lie. It is a lie. It's not a minor thing. That's yeah. a total lie. Yeah. The number is zero. Yeah. And they staged this mock funeral. Well, they didn't call it mock, but a, a mock, you know, funeral in the Capitol Rotunda for Brian Sicknick for losing his life at the hands of protesters during January 6th so-called riot, uh, Sicknick died in his bed from natural causes, and he was an ardent Trump supporter, as was Ashley Babbitt. Uh, you know, they're all complicit in the murder of Ashley Babbitt. It's all on video for crying out tears. And Nancy Pelosi is the prime culprit. She covered up the, uh, his, the identity. Michael Byrd is the killer. And... Um, you know, rewarded him, freed him, gave him a, a medal for defending the Capitol. That's that's an accomplice to murder. No charges. You, no trial. Yeah. You, you, and that, you, that's the future. With the, You can't count on the Democrats to have the, a smidgen of morality or principle. That's the most frightening thing. 
You know, for all the reasons we feel sluggish sometimes and maybe not at our physical best, we think about a lot of things. What did I eat? What did I drink? What have I been exercising? But do we think about our liver? You know, your liver takes care of you. It, it functions in hundreds of ways for your body and you need to take care of your liver. I mean, if you have that sort of fatty liver, you're three and a half times more likely to have heart failure than most Americans. And and the American Liver Foundation says 100 million of us in America have fatty liver. So let's start taking care of it. Here's the solution. Liver health formula. It's an all natural supplement. It contains 12 clinically proven botanicals. It helps recharge and protect your liver. It's made here in the USA, approved by American doctors. So if you want to ignite that fat burning metabolism and boost your energy, transform how you look and feel, try liver health formula and receive five free gifts. When you order today, you'll get a free bottle of nano powered omega three to keep your heart healthy. And then you'll get four free eBooks to support every aspect of your health. Try liver health formula today by going to getliverhelp.com slash sideline. That's getliverhelp.com slash sideline. Remember those five free bonus gifts, getliverhelp.com slash sideline. How, how, how did we get here? We're, I mean, it's, oh. it's, 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 it's astonishing to me. And uh, look, it's, we've had a... I'll tell you exactly where. Okay, tell me how we got here. In 1968, Tom Hayden organized a riot at the Democrat convention to destroy the electoral chances of Vice President Hubert Humphrey, who was the nominee of the Democrat Party, or about to be the nominee of the Democrat Party. And he, he did it, and the people who were in the riot did it because Hubert Humphrey was an anti-communist. And then Hayden and Jane Fonda led the left into the Democrat Party. I remember this very well because I was horrified. I saw, I was a radical, and, and so were they. So they should have seen the Democrat Party as the uh, as uh, the enemy. But they infiltrated the party, formed these caucuses like the Black Caucus, which is a Louis Farrakhan caucus, by the way, a bunch of racists. Um, uh, and they took over the next fifty years. They took over the Democrat Party. But Barack Obama was one of them. He was raised by communists, and actually his mentor was a Soviet agent. Um, I know all of this sounds like tinfoil hat stuff, but actually it isn't. <laughs> it's reality. I mean, you know, anyway, I'm hey. not going to defend my tinfoil hat. No, you I don't need there. to. I knew these people. I knew Hayden. He, Hayden said to me, uh, when the... Uh, there was a piece of land that was owned by the university in Berkeley and the left took it over and called it people's park. Been there many times. And, and the, the cops came to evict them because they, it was supposed to be for dormitories. Um, and I, I was standing there with Hayden when the tear gas began flying. And I was worried that somebody was actually, somebody did get killed that somebody would get hurt. So my, I was such a deviant um, early on. And I, Tom saw my fear and he said, David, what we have to do is we have to lure middle-class kids into situations where the cops will crack their heads and that will make them radical. That's the mentality. That That is what he said to you. That was a, that's an exact quote. I would inscribed in my mind. People, we have to get middle-class kids. We have to lure them into situations where the police will crack their heads and make them radicals. <sighs> he was a very bad man, Tom Hayden. And uh, who, who gave him? Clinton gave him the Medal of Freedom. <laughs> um, it, th so it happened over a 50-year period. Yeah. Yeah. And Republicans did not pay attention. Did they not pay attention or were they afraid to push back because of, you know, the they Democrats? They were called racist. Say it, it again? It was very effective. They were called calling, racists, yes. Calling people racists. Yeah. Very effective. Yeah. Is it as effective now, David, as it was? No. No. No, they've worn it out. Yeah. Well, look, 
People forget this about Trump. And that is, in the history of the United States, no incumbent president before Trump got more votes than running for the second term, and that includes Obama. Trump got 11 million more votes in a rigged election than the, rigged by the Democrats the second yeah, can, time. Can we drill Get down on that? 75 million people have yeah. withstood the propaganda. Yes, and, and the other side, the Democrats will tell you, well, Biden got more. So let's, can I drill down well, on that with you yeah. for a minute? So t- tell me why you believe the election was rigged. I want to know from your okay, point of view. I, here's, here's what I say in my book, Final Battle. Final Battle, folks. You can find People it. People ask the wrong question, which is the one you just asked. Okay. Is the, was the election rigged? Nobody knows because there never was an audit of the vote. We have There's no evidence one way or the other that that's conclusive. Uh, so when I say the election's rigged, it's just my opinion. Okay. The Democrats' response is you're a traitor to democracy, mm-hmm. which shows you how guilty they are. I mean, it's a, it's, you, you can't suppress dissent in this country without destroying the country. Mm-hmm. Um, in July 2020, seven months or so before the election, um, the Democrats sent out a task force consisting of 600 lawyers and 10,000 volunteers to change the election rules in battleground states. Right. And, for, and, and to do it often illegally, as they did in Pennsylvania, which was a vital swing state. Um, according to the Constitution, it's in the Constitution that the state legislatures set the election rules. Mm-hmm. But in Pennsylvania, they went and got the Supreme Court, which was dominated by Democrats, to set the election rules. And, you know, there's been, now there's been several books. Dinesh D'Souza wrote a book. Molly Hemingway wrote a book, and there's other books that document how they rigged the election rules so the Democrats won those states. And people forget this was the tiniest margin in the history of presidential elections. Mm -hmm. It was settled, as it were, by 42,000 votes out of 159 million votes. Uh, Joe Biden won by 0.027% of the vote. And then look at the way they ran the country as though they had a landslide. Yes. Uh, they, they hate America and they hate, they hate the Constitution they regard as a white supremacist document. It's insane. The word white doesn't appear in the no, Constitution, <laughs> nor does the word black. Yeah. And there were 500,000 free blacks on the eve of the Civil War. It's it's not a white supremacist document. There there couldn't be 500,000 free blacks if that were the case. So why? All the blacks who were enslaved, or like the vast, vast majority, were enslaved by black Africans and sold at slave auctions. So the Bottom line is that black people enslaved black people and white people at enormous sacrifice, 360,000 dead, uh, freed blacks. So, you know, I mean, if they want reparations, these radical extortionists, they should sue the Confederacy, not, not the government that sacrificed 360,000 lives. This is unprecedented in the history of the planet, that one race would make such a sacrifice to free another. So why then do, as you put it, do Biden and the Democrats hate America? What is there to hate? they're communists. What do they want? Just power? Well, yeah, but they want want everybody to be equal when everybody is obviously not equal. I mean, if you think you're equal, try duplicating what Steph Curry does on a basketball court, which is why he's rich and we're not. (laughs) I couldn't agree with that more. I mean, I constantly say life isn't fair. If it were fair, we'd all look the same. We'd all have the same talents. It it, it is ridiculous. Um, The book is Final Battle. The next election could be the last. You... 
I realize, forgive me, you, you, you want to sell books, but at the same time, you know, when someone says to you, if I were to ask you, do you really believe we're on the cusp of a civil war? Really? No, I, the federal government is way too big for there to be a civil war. Okay. Um, and, and this, and nobody should, nobody on the right should be talking about seceding from the union. That's yeah, terrible. Yeah, I, I know, I know. We ha- this is America. We have to fight for it and win it or lose it. That's that simple. I couldn't agree with you more. And I think you're referring to Marjorie Taylor Greene for, for saying, you know, we need a national divorce and yeah, the red states and the blue states. That's, off. Yeah, yeah that it's, you know, just as she gives the right a bad name, people like Alexander Ocasio-Cortez and Cory Bush and oh, Ilhan Omar. A, you know, I, I call it the Nazi caucus. The Nazi They're caucus. all Jew haters. <laughs> But what they do, in my estimation, is they hide behind the virtue signaling of Black Lives Matter and, you know, a women. A criminal organization, Black Lives Matter. Yeah. And petty, low-class criminals. They're the kind of people who steal from the collection plate at churches on Sundays. That's their mentality. Raise money for black people and put it in your pocket. Yeah, or it's buy, buy some nice real estate and drink champagne. <laughs> um, let's let's. I I do want to get into one other subject with you before I let you go, and that is the sixteen nineteen project again, focusing on this area of race. They weren't and, slaves. First of all, they weren't Americans. America was born with the Declaration of Independence which was 180 some odd years after 1619. They were English colonists, which is different. We fought a revolutionary war based on the proposition that all men are not only created equal, but have a God-given right to liberty. Mm -hmm. That's America. Mm -hmm. Uh, These, the, the woman who devised this, Nicole Hannah Jones, is a raving racist. I mean, she said the ugliest things about white people as a whole, as a group. Um, the, 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 the alleged slaves that were shipped to Virginia, first of all, Virginia didn't have slavery in 1619. Secondly, the labor force was mainly indentured servants, and these were indentured servants. And where do I learn this? Uh, in an essay by Nell Painter, who is a black left-wing Princeton historian uh, uh, and a premier historian. She's very, very accomplished, very respected. Uh, that's where you can learn the truth about this. This is just an attempt to smear white America. Um, so. Well, every totalitarian movement has a scapegoat race. And it's the way the Nazis used the Jews, only the Jews um, didn't have the resources that white people have. So we've got a battle on our hands, but we have to win it. Or it's, just, it, it's unbelievable the Ku Klux Klan type racism that, that the Democrat Party represents today. Just unbelievable. And yet they sell themselves as the party of, you know, African. Because Republicans are tongue tied. What's the matter with them? (laughs) Well, they're afraid to be called racist and homophobes and xenophobes and transphobic and all the rest. Just just insanity. Yeah. Anyway, that's the battle we have to fight. And your key to winning that battle is? Is speaking up. There's the Trump movement. Uh, which is patriotic. There's the revolt of the parents in the schools, which is really important. Um, There's the revolt of the comedians, which is also really important. Uh, And people, you know, America is not Weimar Germany, which is where Hitler won. He he was actually elected. He got the chancellorship. America is a very individualistic country. We had a frontier. People don't take guff from the government if they can help it. They're very skeptical of government. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm, 
I'm a cockeyed optimist. I mean, I was, you're born an optimist or a pessimist. It's just in you. But I think we have a fighting chance. I, I, don't, I don't doubt it for a second. I, I and think you know, if you go up on the internet and you see these, all these reaction videos, and there's all these black guys who look, you know, they're all wearing baseball caps and the, it's not your suit, your suit crowd. Um, and they see right through the race yeah. baloney, yeah. Yeah. right through it. It's just, uh, yeah. it's very and, refreshing. Yeah, it, it is. And I've, I've had a number of those people on my podcast because I want to elevate their voices. Even if I get one extra viewer to them, I, I feel accomplished. Well, I, I feel privileged to be on your show. Uh, it's been, the privilege and the honor have been mine. David Horowitz, thank you so much, folks. Again, the book is called Final Battle. The next election could be the last by David Horowitz. I, I mean, why not? buy all of his books. He's makes so much sense. And, and he, uh, he raises so many issues and he's seen both sides deeply. So I, I so appreciate you. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, I'm going to give my, my only tribute in this podcast to the great Bud Grant. That's next. On Saturday, March 11th, we lost an icon here in Minnesota and I lost a friend. Bud Grant, the Hall of Fame head coach of the Minnesota Vikings. He was proud of that Hall of Fame ring. I asked him one time in an interview, well, people say you got to four Super Bowls, but you didn't win any of them. What do you say? And he put out his fist with the ring right there, the Hall of Fame ring prominent, like I'm a Hall of Famer. He was proud of that. But this man was stoic in the best of ways. He was emotional. He cried when he talked about the anthem and standing for the anthem because he knew so many people who came home in boxes from Vietnam he and other places. He was a family man first and foremost. I mean, he retired as a head coach much earlier than most people do. Why? Because he wanted to raise his family and hunt and be with his family. About a week ago, I was in a, at an event for the Minnesota Vikings at the museum there in Egan. And Bud was supposed to be there. And I was one of the speakers and Bud was supposed to speak after me. But we were informed that Bud wasn't feeling that well. But it wasn't a big deal. He's 95. He had his good days and his bad days. He just wasn't up to coming along and, and speaking before his friend as had been planned. And that friend was Bob Hagen, the PR director for the Vikings for 32 years and uh, who is moving into an emeritus role. But either way, uh, Bud's son, Mike Grant, a phenomenal high school head coach at Eden Prairie High School, stepped in and spoke for his father. And I recorded it all and I texted it to Bud and his his gal, Pat, and, so that they could see Mike speaking. And Pat was texting back with me. We missed seeing you tonight and so forth. That was Thursday. And on Saturday morning, he had passed at the age of 95. Bud could not have been kinder. He could not have been more fun or funny. He could not have been more patriotic. He could not have been more stoic in the best way. He was tough. He embodied to me what it meant to be an American, a father, a coach, a husband, a partner, a friend. He was simply the best. And I'm going to miss him a lot. And America misses Bud already. Coach, rest in peace, friend. This has been Sideline Sanity. Be brave and do good. 